Morning, everybody. Great to be with you today. I want to welcome you, and I want to just stop and pause and welcome all those that are joining us online right now. Welcome. We're just glad that you're joining with us. And I want to just say that I am so super excited about the message today. And I want to just encourage you to grab the outline on the back of your bulletin, or you can bring it up electronically using the YouVersion app. And while you're doing that, I just want to um, encourage you that the month of May is what we call um, small group sign-up time. And we're ramping up for our summer small groups that start in June. So this is the month that we're preparing for those summer small groups by um, prayerfully considering where God would have us be planted in a small group. Signing up for one of those small groups last week, the uh, summer small group catalog came out. And if you were here, you got one of these. If not, please grab one of these and you can uh, just decide what small group is for you this summer. You can sign up out in the foyer. You can sign up online. And we just encourage you to stay connected in a small group. Well, hey, we're in week number three of our series on the Holy Spirit called More. And we kicked it off two weeks ago, week one. And we were talking about who is the Holy Spirit. And I said that sometimes when we, what we don't understand, we can keep at arm's length. And that's why it's so important that we kicked off the series just learning who the Holy Spirit is, understanding him more, that uh, the Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a him, and he's God, and, and he's you know, nothing to be afraid of. He's not weird. He's a refreshing breath of fresh air that wants to be our voice and our teacher and our guide and our helper through life. And when we really understand who the Holy Spirit is more, we'll want him more. So what does more the Holy Spirit look like? Last week, uh, Deb brought a great message on what more of the Holy Spirit looks like, and it just all starts with the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, More of the Holy Spirit is more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And that is just where it all starts. That's the irrefutable evidence that the Holy Spirit is filling our lives. Now, not today, but next week and the week after that, we're going to take a couple weeks and we're going to talk about the spiritual gifts. And I say that plural, spiritual gifts. And we need two weeks because if you look through Scripture, Scripture mentions about 25 different um, gifts of the Holy Spirit. So that'll be starting next week, but today we're going to be talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice I said how I said that there, there's gifts, plural, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about next week, but today we want to talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit or how the Holy Spirit has been given as a gift to the church. And we call that scripturally, we call that the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us um, have heard of water baptism and many of us have been water baptized. We know that that's something that we do that follows salvation when we declare our faith publicly. Well, being baptized in the Holy Spirit is uh, an experience that happens after salvation where we experience the filling or the fullness of the Holy Spirit or we experience Pentecost, Pentecost. What is that? We're going to talk about that today. In fact, today, Sunday, May 20th, is actually called Pentecost Sunday, and I'll explain why in a few moments. But today's message is this. It's understanding and experiencing Pentecost. So today, I'm going to take a few minutes and just want to help you understand what Pentecost is, but I want to underscore the and. And we also want to take time today to experience Pentecost in our life, to to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, to to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So at the end of service, we're going to have a response time, and and I'm just going to call you to to, to receive all that, that God would have for us. And how many of you know that if there's something that God has for us that he calls a gift, we don't have to be afraid of that, right? It's a gift for us. It's a free gift, and he wants to give us more of himself. So sometimes when we think of the word Pentecost or we've heard the word Pentecost, we immediately associate it, watch this, with a denomination, right? Like we'll say, oh, those Pentecostals or the, that Pentecostal church, and, and, you know, there's many different things that can pop in your head when you, when you hear 
that, that, that phrase, Pentecostals, Pentecostal church, and, and that's because there is a wide range of what that means as, as far as, you know, there's, uh, they've been called holy rollers and tongue talkers and, you know, some of them handle snakes. And so sometimes when you, when you hear the word Pentecostal, you, you, you get a little hesitant. You're like, man, I don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. But, you know, God never, listen to this, God never intended Pentecost to be just connected with the denomination. God always intended Pentecost to be something that we, all believers, can experience. In fact, can I more correctly say that God always intended it to be someone that we can experience, more of God. Pentecost was never meant to be associated with a denomination, but for us as believers to have more of God in our life, and that's what we want to talk about today. So because we've all come from different denominations, um, I just want to, in fact, let's do that today before we get started. Let's just have a little fun. Uh, take a real quick survey. You can just raise your hand to participate. But I was going to ask you know, what, what your background is, right? So how many of you have come from, let's say, a Baptist background? Just raise your hand. Baptist, any, you grew up Baptist? Okay, cool. How many of you grew up Methodist? Methodist church. Come on, Methodist. All right, a couple of you. How about Lutheran? A little Lutherans, okay. All right. How about Catholics? You you were Catholic background, okay? How about Pentecostal? Two hands, two hands, two hands. All right, some of you just got that, all right, okay. Now, some of you, you you've been raising your hands for like several of these. You're like, yeah, I tried that one, I tried that one, I tried that one, I tried that one. Well, no, how, how many of you, you've come from none of those backgrounds? Like, like you just came to Jesus, come on, like no, no backgrounds, okay? That might even be the best, but, but anyways, um, I want to just... Have some fun today. Ecclesiastes 3 says that, you know, there's a time to laugh. Come on, church. There's a time to laugh. Can we just laugh a little bit before we just dive into this? Come on, let's laugh a little bit. And I want to just share a little funny with you. And uh, in light of what we just shared, all of us come from different backgrounds. So let's just have, have a little fun with this. And this is um, how many of these denominational people does it take to change a light bulb? Ready? Okay, so how many agnostics does it take to change a light bulb? None, because they're still trying to figure out if a light bulb really exists. <laughs> how many Calvinists does it take to change a light bulb? None. God has predestined when the lights will be on. Okay, you can laugh a little more. Come on, we're having fun in church. You can laugh. It's okay. Okay, here we go. How many fundamentalists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, the Bible does not say anything about light bulbs. <laughs> okay, here you go, Baptist background. Baptist, how many does it take to change a light bulb? Fifteen, one to change the bulb, three committees to approve it, and a couple to decide who's going to bring the refreshments. <laughs> how many Roman Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? None, because they're using candles. <laughs> how many TV evangelists does it take? to change a light bulb. Two, one to change it, and one to ask us to send in our donation today. <laughs> How many Pentecostals does it take to change a light bulb? Ten, one to change it, and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. <laughs> and on and on and on. It could go on, but that's enough. Okay. Anyways, so we're having a little fun today in church, and we're learning about Pentecost. So, Cornerstone Chapel, what are we? I mean, we, we belong to this family, this denomination called Foursquare, and, you know, that means that Jesus is our Savior, and our baptizer in the Holy Spirit, our healer, and soon coming King, he's coming back for us. And because we believe that Jesus is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit, that would cause us as Foursquare to be considered Pentecostal. However, they, there are, there's different brands of Pentecostals, and we, we have a, our own distinct brand of, of what that means. And in fact, there's different kinds of, of, of Pentecostals, and, and our Foursquare family came out with this, what I call a mini booklet. It's about 28 pages, and our leadership felt that it was really important that, that we really clarify how Foursquare is distinct. Like, what is our distinct brand 
of being Pentecostal and what we believe about the Holy Spirit. And so they made this available to us. And when I received this, I'm not a huge book reader, but I devoured this. I read it in uh, just very quickly, about a half hour it took. And I started passing this out to the staff and council and elders. I'm like, you guys got to read this. This is so great. It's so helpful to, to understand our, our roots and, and what we really believe as Foursquare followers of Christ, and, and I felt it was so important to, that, that it's just to make it available to everybody, we did that. And uh, if you'd like to read this mini book, which won't take you very long, you can actually get it on our website. You go to our homepage, cornerstonechapel.org. You don't have to click really anywhere else. You just stay right on the homepage. Scroll down until you see this Foursquare logo where it says Foursquare Church Distinctives. Click right there on link. It'll come up, you can read it, print it, download it, whatever you want. And I'm telling you, I want to encourage every single person to, to read it sometime soon. It's so helpful. But I wanted to just read part of this today that kind of talks about what we're talking about with the baptism with the Holy Spirit and what, what it means to be uh, Pentecostal. So um, it says, during a leadership meeting in the 1970s, so this was a long time ago, several uh, four square leaders represented the denomination at a meeting called the Pentecostal Fellowship of North America. When they came back from this meeting, they were insisting that Foursquare needed to incorporate more language in their doctrinal statements that referred to um, speaking in tongues. And they said this, they said, if we are Pentecostal, we need to say we believe in the initial evidence that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and the initial evidence is speaking in tongues. Well, when they told this to the Foursquare president, it says this mildly troubled longtime president, Rolf McPherson, the son of our founder, Sister Amy Semple McPherson, who after a few moments of reflection replied genuinely, listen to this, but we're not Pentecostal, we're Foursquare. Let me go on. It says, Foursquare is without a doubt a Pentecostal organization. The roots of the organization and the spiritual experiences of its founder, Amy Semple McPherson, are easily traced back to the early Pentecostal revivals held at Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Yet, this statement by Rolf McPherson assumes correctly that there is more to defining Foursquare as an organization that simply says, we are Pentecostal. As such, spirit baptism is understood by Foursquare, listen to this, this is what we understand, to be an essential aspect of every Christian's life. We believe that. Yet in drafting the Foursquare Declaration of Faith, it is important to note that our, that our founder avoided using language that referred to speaking in tongues as the only initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Instead, it was stated more ambiguously that the believer may have every reason to expect that when they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, to expect it to look like the same manner which happened in the Bible. Which if you read through Acts, you say that sometimes they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues, but other times they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they had the boldness to preach. And so what our founder was saying was, is that the, uh, the accent here is on the expectation as opposed to saying it is the initial evidence. While it is clear from her writings and sermons that Mrs. McPherson anticipated that speaking in tongues would normally accompany spirit baptism, it is significant that she did not lock herself or the organization into tightly defined language about that experience. In fact, it was in the reference to the fruit of the spirit rather than speaking in tongues that she used evidential language, calling it the irrefutable evidence of the spirit-filled life. Thus, one can reasonably argue that it is in keeping with the Foursquare Declaration of Faith, as well as the spirit and practices of the founder, that Foursquare as an organization embraces a shared expectation of charismatic gifts rather than enforcing a dogmatic assent to the particulars of what has come to be known as classical Pentecostal doctrine. Now, you might hear that and say, I totally get it. You might be thinking, blah, 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 what did you just say? Okay? Basically what this is, says is this. There's different brands of Pentecostalism. There's classic Pentecostals which believe this. 
They believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the only evidence of that is when there is speaking in tongues. The initial evidence is speaking in tongues to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We are not classical Pentecostals. We, are, we have our, our, our own distinct brand of Pentecostalism. And what we're saying is, yes, we definitely expect that, and you, need, you should pray for that, and definitely expect that to happen. But if it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You can keep praying and expecting, but there's other evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, we want to talk about that today. And I want to ask if you would please do me a favor and give me, could you give me a blank slate today? Give me a blank slate saying this. Whatever background you've had or whatever you've seen or heard, let's just come and say, let's look at what Scripture says today about what Pentecost is and what it means for me today. So what is Pentecost? Pentecost is this. Ready? Drum roll. It's a Jewish holiday. It's a Jewish holiday. It's actually one of the three major Jewish holidays. The three major Jewish holidays are Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Now, I know those are kind of strange names for holidays. They had a lot of holidays, but they had three major ones, just like we have many holidays, but we have major ones like Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. But these were the three major holidays that started around the time of Moses, and Jewish people still celebrate these today. But to fully understand what it means for us today, we have to go back to the Old Testament and see what it meant for the Jewish people then, understanding that Matthew chapter 5 says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law or the prophets or the Old Testament, but he came to fulfill it. So when we go back to look at the Old Testament, knowing that Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, so it has application to our life today. So in other words, this is what I'm trying to say. We can see Jesus' plan for our lives by what these three holidays mean. So what do these three holidays mean? Let's look at the first one, Passover. What does Passover mean? The Jews celebrated Passover in this way. They were celebrating when God, listen to this, saved them from being under the bondage and slavery of Pharaoh in Egypt. Many of us know the story. There's a movie about it, the Ten Commandments, right? Where the Jewish people were in slavery and they, Moses was, was, was risen up to be the deliverer of, of, of Israel and he went to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh would kind of give in, and then he would change his mind. He'd give in, change his mind. He did this ten times every time God would send a plague. Frogs, lice, you know, blood in the water, all that stuff. God was trying to motivate the guy to let his people go. Come on, right? Well, Pharaoh wasn't budging until the tenth plague. The tenth plague. It's called the death of the firstborn. Now, you have to understand, Jewish people and and, and Egyptians were living together, and what God says is, Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go this time, the death angel's going to come through, and all the firstborn are going to die, Egyptians and Israelites. But he told the Israelites, he goes, listen, if you get a, a lamb and get the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost, I will pass over your household. That's where they get the name Passover. It's when the death angel passed over All those who had the blood of the lamb over their door frame. So what happened was all the firstborn of the Egyptians died. Pharaoh, that was it. He let the people go. They were saved out of slavery and bondage. So Passover is when the Jews celebrate that they were saved. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us today? Well, Jesus came to fulfill the law in the Old Testament. So today, listen to this, Christ is our Passover lamb. That he shed his blood that we can have complete forgiveness of sins and experience salvation. So the Jews celebrated Passover to celebrate when they were saved from Pharaoh. What Passover means for us today is we get to experience salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? So what's Pentecost mean? Pentecost is the second major holiday that the Jews celebrated. And what they celebrated was when God gave them the law. In fact, the word Pentecost, pent means five, costi means to the tenth power. So five to the tenth power is the number 50. So what happened back when 
But the Pharaoh let the people go and the people were delivered from, from the Egyptian slavery. What happened is they went out into the desert, they came to this mountain, and God called Moses to go up this mountain and God was going to give Moses the law. Again, maybe you've seen the movie, okay, the Ten Commandments where God gives the people the law. Well, what happened during this time is when Moses went up on the mountain, this cloud descended on the mountain. There was rumblings of thunder, and a fire was there, and God inscribed the law on two tablets of stone. Well, what does that mean for us today? I mean, Christ came to fulfill the law, so so are we celebrating the law? No. It says in the New Testament... In a very similar fashion, it says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you on that day. So when the day of Pentecost came, what does that mean, when the day of Pentecost came? What's Pentecost mean? Fifty. So fifty days from when the children of Israel were delivered out of Pharaoh, God gave them the law. Well, fifty days after Jesus, our Passover lamb, went to the cross, fifty days later, this happened, and it says this, They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound. Remember there was a big rumbling on the mountain in the Old Testament? Well, here you go in the New Testament. There was a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Remember on the mountain there was fire? And there was fire here. Fire that separated and came, watch, came to rest on them. Remember there was a big cloud on the mountain? And the Holy Spirit descended on these early believers. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. In the New Testament, Jesus came to fulfill it. So we celebrate a brand new covenant. And what Pentecost means to us is that we can receive power to make a difference. Let's look at the third one. The holiday called Tabernacles. Kind of a strange name, but Tabernacles, or the Feast of Tabernacles, was when the Jews were celebrating what happened from the time they got the law. They started wandering through the desert until God led them into their, watch, their promised land, or their final destination, right? Well, this took many years, so during that time when they were wandering around in the desert, what they would do is they would set up these little temporary huts or tents. That's where you get the name tabernacles. It was like a little temporary hut that they would set up. And, and what, they, what they would do is they, they were wandering through the desert until they came to their promised land. And this, this, this um, holiday is also called the Feast of Trumpets. I'm going to share with you why that is so significant But, okay, so what does that mean for us today? Jesus came to fulfill the law in the Old Testament. So watch how similar this one is. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the what? Trumpet call of God. See, one day, one day there's going to be a trumpet blast in heaven. And all those who have given their life to Christ and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, one day we are going to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ. And we are going to be, see right now we're wandering around this temporary world that we live in. But God has a final destination. Just like the Jews were wandering around until they got into their final home, the promised land. That's like us. We're wandering around on this earth. But we have a final destination, church. It's called heaven. And one day that trumpet's going to sound and we're going to be caught up in the air. It says the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So what does this mean for us today? Well, tabernacles to us means that we someday will experience the return of Christ. So the Jews celebrated Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles for the reason of being delivered from slavery and the giving of the law and the wandering through the desert into the promised land. Today, what it means for us is we get to experience salvation, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we will one day See the Lord and live for him forever and ever. That's good news. That's good news. So what does this mean for us today? Well, a lot of times we kind of connect with the first one. Like, you know, we've been saved and we connect with the third one. You know, we know someday we're going to be in heaven forever and ever if we've accepted Christ. But many times we kind of don't understand Pentecost. We don't understand 
you know, what this means for us today, and we can skip right over, but what it means is we have to understand that, that this is for us today, church. It's for every believer, and we have to understand what that means. Look, in the Old Testament, it was prophesied in the book of Joel where it says, and afterward, God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Now, when the Bible says all people, guess what that means? You. <laughs> You, you're included in that all people. God never intended it to be just a denomination. Well, there's the Baptists, the Nazarenes, and there's Pentecostals, and it's only for the Pentecostals. God never intended that. Never. God intended the baptism with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to experience Pentecost. He always intended to give more of himself to every and all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Old Testament prophecy, prophesying what will come in the New Testament. Then Jesus speaks about it in the New Testament. Jesus said, on the last and greatest day of the festival... Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, I love this, look what Jesus shouted in a loud voice, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Anyone, anyone, guess what anyone means? All of you. See, Jesus is calling, and I love how he, he words this because as I was meditating on, meditating on this scripture this week, I think it's interesting that Jesus is saying, hey, are you thirsty? You know, and you could almost say, are, are you hungry and thirsty for, for, what, for more of what God has for us? And I started to think of some of the, some of the times in the past when when I've been with family or friends or church family, and we've just been eating meals together because we do that a lot, right? And maybe just your normal dinner time, moms, when you're preparing meals, but have you ever been in a situation, check this out, have you ever been in a situation where you just cannot wait till you hear, dinner's ready, right? Like you are so ready to eat because you are so starving, hungry. No, I mean, as soon as you hear, you jump out of your seat and you're, you get your plate and you're ready to eat. You're ready to drink. Why? Because you're hungry and thirsty. Nothing's holding you back. Okay, let me ask you this. Listen to this. Have you ever been in a situation where either you've prepared the meal or maybe you're the one, but they're like, time to eat. And like nobody's coming. Like, they're just sitting around, dilly-dallying around, talking, still watching the game, still on the computer. And if you've prepared the meal, you're like, God said it's time to eat. I mean, have you ever done that? Like, I've done that. I've prepared and nobody comes. I'm like, come on, I'm Italian, manja. Man, come on, it's time to eat. You know? But I've been on the other side, too, where I've been dilly-dallying around. because it's just. And, you know, I started to think, why, when it's time to eat or drink, why do, you, why do you immediately respond? Because you're hungry and thirsty. Why are there times when you don't? I think there's a couple reasons. Because you're not hungry. Because you don't like what's being offered. Or what you're doing is a little more important than getting up and eating. Or maybe you're a little suspicious of the food being served. I think many times, listen to this, Jesus is saying, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. All you who are hungry, come and eat. I have a table prepared for you. Come. And we don't because we're just not hungry for more of God. We're content with, we, we're, we're not hungry. Um, or what we're doing is more important. Or we're a little suspicious of them, not too sure about that. And today, on Pentecost Sunday, which the reason why this is Pentecost Sunday is because 50 or 7 weeks from when we celebrated Easter, it's been 7 weeks, all every year, 7 weeks from Easter, it's called Pentecost Sunday, where we as the church celebrate 
that the Lord wants to fill us with a fresh touch of his Holy Spirit. And so today, I believe Jesus is saying this to, it, to, to us today. And it says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And so look at this next one where Jesus dies, he's buried, and he rises again. It says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. So when Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, he didn't go right to heaven. He kind of he would appear to his disciples. And it says over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift. Notice it's singular, gift. Not gifts, not the gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to talk about that next week. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about wait for the gift, singular, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, experience in Pentecost. Wait for this gift, my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days, there it is, 40 plus a few days, that's 50, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to say? The Old Testament prophesied, Jesus spoke it, and we see it happening, that God's intent was always to give us more of his Holy Spirit in our lives. It's for everybody, not just a certain denomination. So what does it mean to experience Pentecost? Now that we hopefully understand it a little better. What does it mean to experience Pentecost? Well, experiencing Pentecost means, I want to give you three things today. And the first one is this. Experiencing Pentecost for us today means the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. To live righteously. What does this mean? It means the Lord wants to fill us first and foremost with his presence that we live for Jesus that our life reflects Christ, that it's not just, well, I have to do, I have to follow the Bible. It's like, no, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, he changes your have to to a want to. Come on. He changes your appetite. He changes your your, your spiritual palate. He he, he changes your desires. He changes your, your ability to resist temptation He gives you strength to resist the world and resist the flesh so that you can live righteously before God. The the, the dirty jokes just don't seem to be funny. The gossip just leaves you kind of a pit in your stomach. The selfishness and the pride just like, ugh. Like you, there's just a, you're, you're, you're more hungry for something different, something more, the ways of God. The Bible says in Romans, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. What does it mean to be controlled by the Holy Spirit? I think it means this. I think it means when we give up our control to the Holy Spirit. I think when it means we're driving the, the, you know, our life and we have the hands, hands on the wheel of our life, I think it means this. Lord, w- w- would you, I, I want to give you control of my life. I want to follow you. And when we do that, the Bible says it's pleasing to God. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Meaning this, when we are in control of our life, it leads to us being dominated by the sinful nature in all different ways. But when we give up control to the Holy Spirit, let him have his way in our life, it leads to peace. You know what this means? You know what? Living in sin and, and, and always wrestling with sin and the world and flesh and temptation, that's exhausting. Have you ever been struggling with a sin and you try to hide it or you try to like work it out on your own, like you, you just kind of stay in that rut? It's exhausting. It is. And God says there's a better way to live. Just give up control to God and do it his way and you'll experience this peace in your life. Some of you today, you're exhausted because you're in control. And God says, would you just let go? Would you receive the the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Let the Lord control your life and watch what God God will do. See, being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. 
it makes me better than me. Meaning this, throughout, I think, church world, sometimes Pentecostals get this haughty attitude like, well, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm speaking, to, you know, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 and I'm better than those non-Pentecostals. That's pathetically gross to God. That is, that is pride. God hates that. We shouldn't go around thinking we're better because we have some revelation about the Holy Spirit that other people don't have. Please don't do that. You know what it means? It doesn't mean I'm better than any other people. It means I'm, I'm getting better than me. Like, I need to get better. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And you know, you know what about feeling? Like, like do, I feel, do I ever feel the Holy Spirit? I think there's times when you, when you will legit feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It could be at your house. It could be in a worship service. It could be driving your car. It could be just out taking a walk. You will feel this, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Here's why I think God does that. I, my opinion, I don't think God ever just kind of like does that so we get this, you know, goosebump feeling. What I believe is happening, because I've experienced that. I think when we feel the presence of God, sometimes we'll get choked up or tear up or just sense the Lord working in our life. I think what God's doing, I think he's doing a deep work in our heart to change us. And we're just overwhelmed in a good way by what he's doing in us. So experiencing Pentecost means, number two, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live supernaturally. He empowers me to live beyond my natural means. How many of you know we got flesh and blood, this, this natural, earthly vessel we call our bodies someday this body will expire i'll die the body will be put in the ground but guess what the holy spirit of god lives within me as well and god never intended us for us to do life in our own natural strength we are vessels of his presence and that means when you're baptized with the holy spirit the holy spirit wants to fill us so that we can do more than just natural things we can do supernatural things in the lord as well Look at this verse. It says, the disciples said, for we brought the good news to you, not with words only, but also with the power and the Holy Spirit. What Paul was saying here is this. I wasn't just doing ministry in my own natural self. There was something beyond me that was happening through me called the Holy Spirit working in and through me. Like I can do this much naturally, but I can do way more when I allow the Holy Spirit to work through me. And so Jesus said, I give you power and authority to, 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 pre to preach the gospel, to, to heal the sick, to cast out devils, to, to do signs and wonders. And, and God wants to work those things through us. Number three, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live on mission, to live on mission. What does this mean? It means that God has, has a purpose. And some of us are still trying to, we're still learning that, we're still Still figuring that out, but man, we're on this earth for a reason, and, and God has a mission, and that mission is reaching people and making disciples. I like to say it this way. God's, God's mission needs to become our mission, and that mission is deep, have, depopulating hell and populating heaven. Amen? Like the mission that we have while we're still on this earth is to try to get as many people to not go to hell. That's called depopulating hell. Preach the gospel. Present Jesus to people. See people get saved and reach people for Christ. And let's populate heaven. Let's turn the population numbers upside down and populate heaven. Well, guess what? We can't do that in our own natural strength. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to give us that ability to be on mission for Jesus, sharing our story, sharing our faith, witnessing to people, discipling people, loving on people that don't know Christ yet, instead of separating ourselves because of fear or pride, no, having the power of the Holy Spirit for us to make an impact in people's lives. The Bible says this, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news of the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So hopefully by now, hopefully, maybe a couple of you, your heart, heart is pounding, you're like, man, that's what I want. 
I mean, if there really is something from God, and it's a gift, that means he has something more for me that will help me live for him more, and I can do greater things for him, and I can help, like, reach people, like, dude, I'm in. Like, I'm in. Like, remember I asked for a blank slate? Because some of you are thinking, man, I remember, like, I remember I seeing that, I heard about this, and that church down the road does this, and all these, uh, blank slate. We just learned what the Bible says Pentecost is. It's a gift that God wants to give us to make a difference in our lives, in other people's lives. So Jesus is calling us. Hey, anybody thirsty for that? Anybody hungry for that? And if you're saying, yeah, I am, then let me, it's not in your notes, but let me just real quick just give you three kind of steps to receive that today. The first one is, we've got to repent. We, we, we've got to repent. Repentance is this. Repentance is, is recognizing I probably have a lot of stuff in my life that's taken up space that God could fill, but my sin is there. I'm holding on to stuff of the world, my flesh, sin, stuff that's just holding me back. And God says, if you want more of him, make more room for him. Make more room. It's called repentance. Repent from that junk and turn away from that. There's a much better way. It's an emptying of ourselves, emptying ourselves of our pride and our selfishness and our, our independent spirit, emptying ourselves. God, I repent today. And I want to make room for more of you. The Bible says it. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And watch what happens. And you will receive the gift, singular, the gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. Second thing is we need to request the Holy Spirit. Request or ask. So we repent, we make room, and then we ask, Lord, I just, I just desire more of you, Lord. I, I ask that you would come and fill my life, baptize me in the Spirit. I, wanna, I don't want to just hear about Pentecost. I want, I want to experience Pentecost. I want to be filled with your presence. The Bible says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who do what? Ask. It's not do three somersaults and, you know, this and that and this and that and this. He just, just ask. Just ask. So if there's something God has that I can live more righteous and I can do greater things and I can make a difference in someone's life, you're saying all I have to do is ask. I'm not saying it. The Bible is saying it. If we repent and ask, and then after that, we receive. Just receive it. God has a gift for us. Like when, when, you heard, when you first heard about salvation, you're like, here's a free gift. Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins. All you have to do is receive it by faith. You mean I don't have to do good works? No. It's by grace, through faith, just receive it. Okay. I don't deserve it. It's all right. It's grace. God wants to give it to you. Same with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift. You receive it by faith. Well, I don't deserve it. Repent, ask, receive. We don't deserve it, but God wants to give it to us. Amen? So Jesus said to his disciples, it said, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is calling us to today. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Today, the response time is this. Let's search our hearts and say, God, am I hungry and thirsty for more of you? If so, let's repent, let's ask, and let's receive what he has for us today. I'm Pentecost Sunday, May 20th, 2018.